do. I'd like you to introduce helicopter pilot extraordinaire, Captain Kim Kinsler, CEO of Indian Prince Bowl. Lucky, thanks for being here today to tell us about rotary wing flight. Thank you, Sterles. I appreciate it. Hello, everybody out there in Facebook world. It's great to have you here. Uh, yes, I am a helicopter pilot and very proud of it. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about what it's like to be a maritime Navy helicopter pilot at sea. Um, you can go on to Wikipedia or Jane's Aircraft or whatever and really learn about the specifics of this. So I don't want to waste your time about talking about torque and engine ratings and stuff like that. You can find that stuff anywhere. What you can't find out about is what it's really like to be a helicopter pilot in uh, an aircraft at sea, flying from aircraft carriers, destroyers, frigates, um, amphibious ships, you name it, and then what type of life we lead, what it's like to actually be in the aircraft flying on those dark and stormy nights going to the back of a boat. Um, it, Navy helicopter pilots, they're, they're a pretty special breed. Uh, we are actually the only unrestricted naval aviators. Our fixed wing friends, they're only kind of half a naval aviator because they're only flying the, the fixed wing. All naval helicopter pilots, they first go to uh, flight school to learn fixed wing, and then once they master the intricacies of flying fixed wing, then they go on to fly rotary wing. And so when we get our wings, we are actually unrestricted. We can fly both fixed wing and rotary wing, which is kind of cool. Um, the big difference between rotary wing and fixed wing pilots? Well, um, a, a, an aircraft is supposed to fly. Fixed wing aircraft has got those lovely big wings on there, um, lovely engines on there, and, and, and it wants to fly. It's, it's like a, you get an F-18 and it's like a, a, a Ferrari. You sit in it, you just feel like it wants to go, it wants to go forward, wants to go fast. Um, if they lose an engine, well, it's going to glide for a little bit. It'll give them a chance to pull that beautiful handle and eject out. Plane goes this way, they go that way, safe as a house, usually, hopefully. Um, helicopters are a little bit different. Um, helicopter pilots are a little bit different. Your fixed wing pilot is usually outgoing. He uh, uh, loves his own sense of humor or her own sense of humor. I mean, you ask anybody um, who's a, a, a fixed wing pilot's best fan and they'll usually say themselves. Uh, but a helicopter pilot's a little bit different. Helicopter pilots tend to be introspective. They tend to be brooding. Uh, they tend to have a uh, kind of snarky sense of humor. And there's a reason for that. It's because helicopters aren't really meant to fly. So as helicopter pilots, we're always waiting for something to go wrong, something bad to happen. It doesn't always happen. These things are pretty safe and we've got great people working on them. But it's just sort of the mentality that you go, go through. And when you lose an engine or, or something wrong goes wrong with these babies, um, you don't have some, a, a handle to pull for an ejection seat. You're going down with it. So it's, it's a different mentality and different way of thinking uh, about flying than our, than our fixed wing brothers and sisters. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, this aircraft here, this great old SA-60 Bravo Seahawk, which um, I've got a, a lot of hours in. Um, the, the variance that I flew was a little bit different than that, but uh, I'll talk a little bit about it. So this aircraft, it was designed to replace the SH-2 Sea Sprite back in the 70s. And Sikorsky uh, came up with a Navy variant of the Army Blackhawk. As you can see, it looks very, very similar to an Army Blackhawk, but there's a couple of very uh, specific changes that Sikorsky made to make it better for, for shipboard use. The first is, I'll point up to the rotor head up here. It's pretty beefy, as you can see. And it's beefy, it's big, because um, it has a folding mechanism on there. Because just like our, our fixed wing aircraft, on the aircraft carrier, on small ships, you need to uh, uh, keep that space. The space is at, at a premium. So we fold the rotor blades so they're not sticking out. Um, the rotor blades fold after we land. Uh, the tail also folds. The tail will fold inwards. Um, the wheel, tail wheel back here, was moved on the Blackhawks. It's way back in the back there. And on the uh, uh, 60s, it was moved forward uh, so it could have a smaller footprint when it's going to land on those um, uh, smaller deck uh, ships. It also had pylons, weapons pylons, um, accessory pylons. There were one here and one on the other side. And they would carry things like uh, uh, AGM 114 missiles, uh, the Penguin missile, Mark 46 torpedo, just like we have here. Um, uh, fuel tanks, because you know when you're a helicopter at sea, sometimes you may not have as many places to land and get fuel as you'd want, so you want as much fuel as you can. So we'd uh, usually have a fuel tank here that, that we'd also use. Um, so that's the, and the other, the other some small uh, other changes that were made, like it's more corrosion resistant because of all of the uh, sea, um, uh, sea spray and so forth that, that uh, are pretty hard in the wear and tear of, of, of these aircraft. Um, but we're going to get into the, the cockpit here. We'll have a look inside and show you really the difference inside, what's the difference between flying fixed wing and a helicopter, see what it's like. So if you follow me in here, we'll have a look.
Okay, so first thing you notice um, as I'm sitting in here is uh, I've got this thing here called a collective. And I have this, it's a cyclic. This is not a, it's not a stick. It's not um, a, a, a control stick or anything like that. It's called a cyclic. This is called a collective. And these are not rudders, they're pedals. So we'll start with the pedals. The pedals uh, control the tail rotor in the back. And why do we have a tail rotor? Well, if we didn't have a tail rotor, the body of the aircraft would want to spin in the same direction as the, uh, uh, as the rotor head. So to prevent that, the counter torque, because there's torque being placed on the aircraft itself, boosts the tail rotor. So the tail rotor pushes the body of the aircraft one way as the, to counteract the forces of the, of the uh, main rotor that are wanting the helicopter to spin the same way as that. So the tail rotor is very, very important. If you lose the tail rotor, then you, the aircraft will just start spinning, unless you have a lot of forward airspeed, and then the, the weather veining of the aircraft will, will somewhat keep you pointed in the same direction. But when you come down to land, you've got to slow down, and as you low, slow down, then that torque on the, from the rotor head will want to make you spin. So the, the tail rotor is very, very important. So the pedals make you go like this. The collective, that's essentially our power. It's, it's, uh, we don't have a throttle like you do in a fixed wing where you're, you're increasing engine power. We're using the collective. The collective is linked um, to the pitch of the rotor blades, and it's also linked to the engine. So as we increase collective, the pitch on the rotor blades increases, and that's going to want to make you go up. Or if you're pointing the aircraft forward, it'll make you go faster. And it's also linked to the engine, so it's dumping more fuel in there, but it's governed to make sure that you don't over-torque it or you don't droop on your, your uh, rotor speed, which we'll talk about in a second. And this is the cyclic. And the cyclic is your control stick. Uh, forward, forward, back, and sideways. So we're moving in all dimensions, up, down, forward, backward, or staying straight, or, or still in the hover. So we talked about NR. NR means rotor speed. And we have a saying in the helicopter world that NR is life. So over here, as you can see, this is our, our NR, and we wanted to write it 100, write it 100 percent. 100 percent means that it's the most efficient uh, rotor is operating at its most efficient capability, and we want to try and keep it there as much as possible. And there's a governor that's keeping it there, but the governor can't do it if uh, the helicopter is too heavy, it's too hot or too high, uh, say doing mountain flying or whatever it may be, and we try and pull too much power, and the engines just don't have enough power to provide to give you what you need, and then the rotor speed will start drooping. Once it starts going below 96%, now we're in trouble. Now we no longer have the required amount of lift that we need to keep the helicopter flying. So uh, uh, we're always keeping an eye on that. Rotor NR is very, very important. Over here, we've got our torque. Um, that measures the amount of torque that is on the power output shaft coming from the, from the main engines. This is important because if you over-torque the engine, um, then you can essentially burn it out. So we don't want to over-torque, so our NR, our torque, uh, are, are things that we keep a very, very close eye on to make sure that we uh, keep the aircraft within its limitations to keep it flying. Airspeed, right here, so the aircraft goes about, we cruise about 140 knots. Um, it's uh, V and E, the, the, the airspeed not to exceed is 180, but you're not going to go 180 just doing straight and level. Uh, the fastest you might be able to pull might be about 160 knots, but cruising around, going a long distance, you do about 140 knots, um, which is about 150 miles an hour, 155 miles an hour. Over here, we have our rad out. Rad out is very important. When you are uh, over the water and you're trying to hover over the water um, or even just flying around over the water, you have very few references. Um, and especially when you're hovering and if you look down and you try and make a reference off the, off the water, if you've ever seen a picture of a helicopter hovering over the water, you'll see those concentric circles of waves being blown out by the uh, uh, rotor wash. Well, that can give you a false sense that you're moving when you're actually standing still. So you can start moving the helicopter or going up and down uh, unconsciously because you think you're staying still, but your mind plays, your eyes play tricks on you. So this rad out, it's a radar signal that comes down from the nose of the helicopter, bounces back, back up, and it lets us know exactly where it is. And we can couple our automatic flight control system to this rad out to keep us at that, that steady, uh, steady altitude. Here's our barometric altitude and our VSI, vertical uh, speed indicator, to let us know how fast we're going up and down compass and of course our gyro to let us know if we're going up down sideways or whatever um, here's the helicopter pilot's helmet this was mine um, the PRs the, the parachute riggers were very kind enough to uh, with my call sign is lucky they put shamrocks all over it which was kind of cool very nice of them um, so then everyone knew it was me in this helmet because I had shamrocks all over it the uh, helmet a little bit different than our fixed wing folks it's shaped a little bit differently uh, here's our visors clear and um, the uh, uh, daytime visor. Uh, here's a lip light because we fly a lot at nighttime. Um, and then here is the 
uh, attachment for NVGs, night vision devices, NVDs. Uh, we call them goggles. Um, this is for the battery pack, so it fits in the back of your head. And right here is the attachment for the NVGs. It'll go on your front so you can see what you're doing at nighttime. Very, very important for uh, flying over land at nighttime, especially over desert terrain where there's very little reference for things to see, or over the water where, again, there's very little reference or when you're going to the back of the boat. Very, very important. Um, so that's oh, oh, and another thing. Another thing that's different for us. Uh, there goes my helmet. Um, that's different for maritime helicopters is that you have to have a way to stop that rotor. When you shut the engines down, um, you've got to have a way to stop the rotor because if you don't, as the wind is coming over the deck, you get what's called rotor slap, and the rotors start flapping up and down the slower they get, and they could strike the, uh, the tail boom, or they could even come down and strike the deck because they're pretty flexible. So we have this thing here called a rotor brake, and when we shut the engines down, when the rotor speed gets to a certain uh, percentage, then we put the rotor brake on, and that, and that stops it right there, so it prevents the rotors from flapping up and down. So that is our, um, our H60. So personal experience, little sea story. Uh, one of my last flights in the uh, good old H60, I flew H60 Foxtrots in hotels with HS squadrons off the carrier. I was off of uh, the Roosevelt um, with CAG-1. And out at the back of the boat, dark night, as it always is. Nothing ever happens on a beautiful, sunny day. It's always on a, on a bad night. And uh, we have these caution lights here. And here's our, 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 our warning lights. Here's our caution lights over here. And we saw a, uh, I was in this seat, and saw a light flicker on. And it just went on, beep, just like this. And then the uh, mass caution light flickered on and off. Um, so I said to the co-pilot, hey, did you see that? Uh, and he says, yeah. And I says, well, what was it? And he says, I don't know. But it was down in this area down here. Um, we were about a mile and a half off the back of the boat. Uh, we were just hovering to give the LSO, the landing signals officer on the carrier, uh, a, a false horizon, so when he was landing his uh, fixed-wing aircraft, so he could see where the horizon was. So we were in about 150 foot hover. Not a good place to be if something goes wrong. Um, so he points out to me where the, the uh, caution light was, and I thought to myself, huh, that's where the tail rotor caution light is if we should lose, um, lose oil. And I remembered from many, many years ago, gosh, about 15 years before I had read a hazard report about how a helicopter lost oil in their tail rotor from the seal, and that light only came on for a millisecond because all the oil dumped out and then the light went off. Uh, so I thought, hmm, it could be that. So I called the air boss and said, hey, boss, we've got to uh, cancel the tail rotor emergency. And so uh, the boss said, well, let me catch this last fixed wing. It was a F-18 having trouble landing that night. So I flew in close to the back of the boat as I could. Um, that fixed wing aircraft luckily landed. And so I went right in behind him, uh, landed on the back of the boat, shut down. And then the boss calls me uh, on the radio and he says, hey, Lucky, um, you, you should get out and have a look at your, uh, you should get out and have a look at your, um, your tail. So I did, and all down the back of the tail was oil, just covered with oil. So uh, they took the aircraft down into the hangar bay, and when they pulled out the tail rotor gearbox, they found that all the teeth on the tail rotor had completely worn away, just gone. It was like uh, bare metal in there. So we were seconds away from losing the tail rotor. So luckily, uh, I remembered that hazard report that I read before. And luckily, we were in a position where we could land right in the boat. Because if we hadn't, we would have lost a tail rotor and then been a spinning mess going into the, uh, into the water. So th it's, it's something that's always in the back of your mind as a helicopter pilot. One of the worst things you can happen is having something go wrong with one of your control surfaces, the main rotor or the tail rotor. So from there, um, we're going to talk about the other helicopter that I flew. So I'm going to get out of here. So, uh, the other aircraft I flew was it's right up there, and this aircraft is actually in my logbook. It's the venerable H-46 Sea Knight, affectionately known as the Battle Frog, or the Frog, spelled with a P, P-H-R-O-G. Um, this aircraft was designed in the 1950s, uh, and it was, uh, first it was first flown in 1959, and then it was uh, taken by the Marine Corps and the Navy in the early 60s. The Marine Corps flew them extensively in Vietnam. It was the primary... Um, uh, aircraft for moving troops by the Marine Corps in Vietnam. Um, and then they flew the 46 Alphas and 46 Deltas in Vietnam, and then the Navy took on the Deltas, and the Marine Corps um, uh, had the 46 Echoes, which had bigger engines. But this aircraft itself, yeah, it's in my logbook, and the Navy used it primarily for um, uh, search and rescue and for vertical replenishment. And I encourage you, go online 
and go and look at a video of what a vert rep looks like, and especially with the 46s, because it's like a ballet. You get two ships, the aircraft carrier or whatever supply ship it is that you need, and um, the supply ship will be right beside it, and you'll have the two aircraft, and they're going back and forth like this with supplies, dropping them off on that delivery ship. It's, it's a lot of fun doing it. When you're flying it, it's almost like playing a sport, total concentration, um, and it's pretty exhausting uh, doing it for a while. I remember one time we were doing it in the Persian Gulf, and it was uh, about 120 degrees outside. There's no air conditioning in those beautiful aircraft. Um, so after 10 hours, about five of it at nighttime, five during the day, and I walked out of the aircraft and I almost fainted on the ground because you don't even realize all the sweat that's coming out of you as you're doing it. But uh, I had a big old plate of good Navy meatloaf afterwards, full of salt, and I felt much better. Um, so I, I always knew I wanted to fly helicopters. Uh, when I was at the Naval Academy, uh, I remember talking to a master chief who was a crewman on 46s, and he says, hey, son, what do you want to fly? I said, well, I'd like to fly the frogs, sir. I like the mission. I like what they do. Um, so he picked up a uh, paperclip from his desk, and he started bending it. And what you do when you bend a paperclip, it breaks, and it broke. And he says, well, this is what happens to a piece of metal when you bend it for 40 years. Uh, and I said, thanks a lot, Master Chief. I just I enjoy flying 46s anyway. Thanks for your confidence. Um, I've had some wonderful times in this aircraft. It was a great bird to fly. Uh, I did a pretty... Um, Harry Rescue down the South of Pacific. Uh, there was a, um, I was about uh, 600 miles to the west, to the east of Guam down the South Pacific. And there was a uh, Chinese fishing boat, Taiwanese fishing boat that was on fire. And there was, I think, nine um, fishermen in there. And so we went out to, to rescue them. Um, it was uh, 30 foot seas, about 90 knot winds. When we took off from the boat, the boat had to run with the wind. So the wind was behind it to try and reduce the, air, the wind speed over the deck. And when we took off, there was still, um, I think the Airbus told me there was 68 knots of wind over the deck when we actually took off. Um, when we got over the, um, over the raft, the, the fishing boat was on fire and it's coming up and down out of the water. Um, eventually, after multiple attempts to, to get rafts in the water, and at, at one point, the raft was, it wouldn't separate itself from the deploying cord. And it was hanging from underneath the aircraft. And as I'm there trying to hold a hover in these 30 foot seas, uh, the, the raft swings up in front of the helicopter and it looked like it was going to go into the rotor blades um, but thankfully it didn't and it fell back down we cut it away um, eventually when we got the survivors in the raft um, they were telling me that um, all I could see was a wall of water in front of me and they were telling me that as I was holding the hover they were on the crest of a wave I'd go in the, I'd go in the trough and they were looking down on the helicopter so I'll give you an idea what the, what the waves were like but, uh, but we got them all out and we got them safe um, it was one of those nights where um, you wonder how you'd perform in that. And I got to tell you, those, those swimmers that we had, we had a crew chief and two swimmers. They were uh, some of the bravest individuals that I've ever been with to, to drop into the water in a night like that uh, and to sacrifice themselves with it. One of the swimmers almost drowned, and the other swimmer had to go and rescue him without a mask, snorkel, or, or a, a flotation device. But, but he did, and he went on to be a sheriff in the Escambia County Sheriff's Office. I just came to my change of command, which was pretty cool. Um, but it's a great old bird. We love it. Uh, and uh, man, I'd love to go back flying it again because it was a fun aircraft to fly. But I think we're running out of time. So I think we'll open up for questions, whatever they like. I, I could stand here and talk about helicopters all day. But if you've got any questions for me or anything about helicopters, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. So with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Captain Kinsla, we have a question from Jeffrey. And he says, why did the Department of the Navy sunset the Boeing CH-46C night while upgrading the Huey and Cobra airframes? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, so if I had my druthers, they would have gotten a replacement 4046 that looked just like that so I could keep on flying it because it was awesome to fly. Uh, but a lot of that comes down to budget. It comes down to uh, maintenance and, and so forth. So the Navy went to the Grand, the, uh, the Grand Hilo, no, the Hilo Master Plan, which so the Navy was flying um, all the same type model series or, or the type of aircraft so we could have uh, cross-pollination in um, mechanics and parts, uh, in pilots and so forth. So it makes it a lot easier for the Navy to operate and a lot cheaper to operate when we all have the same type of helicopter. So that's the, that's the basic answer for it. So Sam asked, how many crew members were on this Hilo? Sure. Um, so on the 60 Bravo, they could fly with three. Um, and if they're doing a search and rescue mission, they put another one on there to have a sensor operator on the back, pilot and co-pilot up in the front. The seat you saw me sitting in is the co-pilot. The pilot would sit on the right-hand side. The H-60 Foxtrot uh, would have uh, pilot, co-pilot, and two in the back. Um, 
one to operate the sensors, another one to operate the, so the uh, dipping sonar, because the 60 Foxtrot had a sonar that would dip down from the aircraft into the water. Uh, the 46, the crew would be uh, four, two pilots, and uh, crew chief, the second crewman, but the 46 could carry um, up to 24 uh, uh, troops, but rarely would you carry that many because that's a lot of weight on there. So usually you could put about 20 in there if you had to. So we have another question from Johnny, and he says, um, can you elaborate a little bit more on your call sign, and uh, can you share how you got it? Sure. Um, gosh, well, I, I could tell you that uh, it was because I saved the aircraft on this dark and stormy night, or that uh, I was very popular in the bars in Singapore or something like that. But no, um, I grew up in Ireland, so I was named after a leprechaun on the front of a box of cereal. Lucky charms. And um, I have uh, a good friend of mine, Johnny Hartnett, to thank for that. Uh, but luckily, the charms dropped away after the years, and they just get it lucky. Yeah. They're always trying to steal me lucky charms. Nelson asks, do you know if this is the helicopter they retired with around 8,000 hours on the airframe? I don't think so. Um, not I, I, these actual airframes, no. Uh, I can tell you that that 46 has got uh, many tens of thousands of hours on it. And that one, I'm, I'm pretty sure, no. Um, there were a group of, there may have been a, a couple of H-60 Sierras that they put into uh, storage just for the time being as they were... Um, as they were doing the Hilo master plan, waiting for aircraft to, to or squadrons to be ready for the transition. But I'm not aware of, of an 8,000 hour aircraft. Rachel says, do you have to learn how to fly a fixed wing aircraft before you fly a rotary wing? You bet, and that's why we helicopter pilots are awesome because we learn to fly fixed wing and rotary wing. And that's why we are unrestricted. Isn't that right, Sterles, whoever Sterles is, yeah. So, so Johnny's throwing you another one here. He says, what did the Airbus on the Tourara say when you came in too hot with your 46C? <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot for that, Johnny. Um, Johnny told me, uh, who was my co-pilot at the time, the Airbus told me to uh, uh, give Johnny a punch in the face. Um, no, he didn't really, no. So I, it's, it's not for public consumption what the Airbus said to me on the tower. We understand, yeah. absolutely. So Matt says, when did, uh, when did station search and rescue leave NAS? Uh, good question. It was in the, um, just thinking, I think it was in the late 2000s, uh, I think. I think it was the late 2000s, which you know, I'd, I'd wish they were still doing it because I'd be out there flying with them. Uh, Gregory asked the question, have you ever had the opportunity to meet Lieutenant Colonel Graham Boucher of Perfect Storm fame? No, I have not. No, but I've, I've read the book. I've read the book. Yeah. And the funny, when we came back from that rescue, um, the, the, uh, uh, our, our mechanics, their, their maintenance guys, when they got the um, uh, survivors on board, so they, they gave them blankets and hot chocolate and tea and coffee and stuff. They set them down, gave them clothes. And what did they do? They showed them a video of the perfect storm. Yeah, there's uh, sailor humor for you. <laughs> uh, Dave says, what are your thoughts on tilt rotors like the Osprey replacing these conventional helicopters? Yeah, uh, I, I think they're, they're awesome. I would love to get to fly one because they bring so much more to the fight. Um, you can get your troops in there faster. Um, you can put more in there. They're, they're, yeah, they're great. They're a technological wonder. Um, in, in my heart, there'll always be a place for those 46s, but uh, uh, the tilt rotors are, are pretty awesome machines. So we've got someone here that's, that's testing your knowledge here. Uh, Tarva says, can you list in order the 19 functions of the SH-60 AFCS? So the, uh, the 19 functions of the AFCS can be distilled into one thing. They make my life easier. <laughs> hey, we always love things that make yes. your life easier. Yes. So we have one other question. And it comes from Mike, who says, does the MH-60R have occasional problems booting up the avionics? Oh, I couldn't tell you, because I didn't fly the Romeo. Um, but the folks that I know that do fly it, they love it. It's, it's an amazingly capable machine. Yeah. And, and actually, one more. Um, you know, can you share, other than you know, the story you've shared before, one of your most memorable times mm -hmm. aboard flying helos? Yeah. Um, for myself and a good friend of mine uh, who now works out for uh, Admiral Miller Air Forces, uh, we had to go into San Francisco Bay 
We had to fly from San Diego up to San Francisco Bay to pick up the crew, uh, some crew members off of a frigate in San Francisco Bay. So we, um, we flew up, we landed at Moffett Field, and then the next morning we had to take off. And um, Moffett Field, if, if you know where it is, it's just outside San Francisco, just to the south and the east of it. Uh, we took off right before sunrise. Um, as the sun's coming up, uh, the air traffic control told us to fly over San Francisco International Airport below uh, 300 feet so we'd stay out of the way of, of jets landing and so forth. So we fly over and then he directs us to go over Candlestick Park. So as we do, rise the sun is rising and then there's a helicopter VFR route that we took through um, downtown uh, San Francisco, uh, which we did just over the buildings there and then out over the bay, over Alcatraz and then going out over the Golden Gate Bridge, rise the sun is coming up. It was one of the most beautiful things I'd, I'd ever seen. And uh, I've had some amazing, amazing opportunities and some wonderful flights and that, but I will always, just the beauty of that morning will always uh, uh, stick in my mind. So I, th I think that's, that's it, is that it? That's all we have time for, okay. Uh, thanks for watching, I hope I didn't bore you, I hope you enjoyed it, and you got a little bit of, of a feeling about what it's like to be a Navy helicopter pilot. Um, so everyone, go Navy, and uh, fly Navy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Captain Kinsella. And next week, we have the VH3 Marine One, which you can see behind me here. And Major Shep Brown, USMC, will detail that for us. Thursday, May 28th, 11 a.m. Central Time. We'll look forward to seeing you there. Thanks again for joining us, and that's a wrap.